Good afternoon, you are all looking fantastic, the way I love it with the camera on, ladies and gentlemen, it is 3 p.m., 3 p.m. in the Netherlands, and today we are all over the world talking to Sibel, talking to Halle Burton, talking to VP about a market that makes us all extremely excited. What's going to happen with the oil and gas after the COVID-19? Welcome to another edition of the Epic Online Technology Meetings. Germany recently resumed the global discussion on the role of oil and gas and the pace of the energy transition to renewables. So how do we answer the urgent calls for better efficiency, productivity and safety? On Monday, March 22nd, we'll discuss how fiber optics have revolutionized well and reservoir surveillance in the oil and gas industry. Various fiber optic sensors are essential to the vital measurements of temperature, pressure, chemical composition, strain, and even acoustics. For example, the common industrial fiber sensing setup consists of a specialty fiber optics going down well, plus interrogation units monitoring the spectral changes between the light sent and the light received back. Wait a minute, specialty fibers? Integrated photonics for fiber interrogators? We have all that know-how in EPIC. It's time to bring these communities back together. Fiber Black Ratings, FBGs, is a well-established technology which boomed in recent years. Ultra-low-cost point sensors distributed along the length of a fiber optic cable. The reason for their success was not only the simplicity of the principle, but also the huge developments in interrogators by companies like Luna Innovations or Photon First. And it's no wonder that companies like Optics 11, FPGS, Silex, Somni, HBK Fiber Sensing, Proximium and Centea are at the forefront now. And what about distributed acoustic sensing, DAS, using real scattering to uncover quasi-microphones all along the fiber? Omnisense and Phoebus Optics have seen growing interest from the petrochemical industry as they discovered the need for DAS. But why? Because of its potential application for downhole surveillance, to monitor fracturing, flow, and even ground movement. Whoa! Of course, there is a lot more, but this video must be short. So come back on March 22nd for full details. For the last four years, EPIC has been closely associated with the C4 Alliance, with our goal of bringing our EPIC technologies to the attention of well-known brands. We have been on their home turf, so now we've sent invites for them to come to ours. Here we go, Halliburton, Chevron, BP, Equinor, ExxonMobil, Schlumberger, Shell, Total, Weatherford, Arabian Ocean Service, Downhole Petroleum, so the list goes on. So join world-leading experts across the oil and gas supply chain at 3 p.m. on Monday, March 22nd. Sign up now in the Zoom room to take an active part in the discussion or watch live or later in the EPIC YouTube channel, now with over 300 hours of brilliant ideas and answers. It is time, it is three o'clock, it is time to talk about oil and gas. Remember this is a photonics meeting, or goal, or job. Anna and me are going to be working for the next two hours crazy-wise to make sure that you find suppliers, customers, and partners, and industrial end users to try your technology all the way to the oil and gas market. Today, I'm extremely happy. I will start these meetings extremely happy. Today, I'm extremely happy to know that we received amazing feedback from the meetings last week, the meeting on LIDAR and the meeting on freeform optics from our members. We keep pushing. Just let me remind you that whenever you miss one of these meetings, you can afterwards check it in YouTube. We keep all our videos, all our meetings there for free. You can check it at any time. It doesn't matter if you're a member or not. We are here for the sustainability of the European industry. And I'm talking on behalf of a fantastic team, a fantastic team that I love. 15 people who with me 
we are dedicating our life to make sure that our Epic members find suppliers, customers, and partners. What we do with my friends is we organize events. I provide access to a network. We help you raise capital. This is very important. If you're a startup and you are looking to raise capital, contact us. We are here to make sure that you succeed. That's our job and that's our passion. We also have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. Check it out. It's awesome. And anyone, anyone who wants a market report, for developing a business strategy to write a European project to find a successful pitch for their investors. We have every Epic member has a long list of market reports from your, from Thematis, all of them for you to use and abuse. Today we are uh, talking about photonic sensors on Wednesday at three o'clock. If you have something else to do, cancel it because we have a meeting on textiles, wearables, fashion and design and it's going to be really, really awesome. You want to find out how Svarovsky is using micro-optics technology. Don't miss that meeting. And also for the first time, in 2021, we are supporting also the quantum industry. And on Friday, we have a meeting on quantum technologies for transport and e-mobility. It's going to be quite fascinating to understand how quantum computing is going to be the solution for the biggest challenge of all, autonomous driving. But today, today we are going to talk about oil and gas. And first of all, I would like to thank the amazing support. You guys are great. The amazing support of ASO Optics. Thank you very much for promoting, for promoting our events and making sure that we reach all the different audiences. It is great that we're working with you. But also, this meeting will be possible without the support of our sponsors today. First, I would like to acknowledge Akhtar all the way from Israel. They provide black coatings for the maximum absorption. All the way from Germany, we have Nano Plus. Nano Plus provides a laser wave, a laser for every wavelength from the from the visible all the way to the mid infrared. But if you're looking also for semiconductor lasers, you have to go to Finland. In Finland, they have moduli. They provide the material growth all the way to the packaging assembly and even providing instruments for satisfying different applications. Furthermore, we have a living member who is a giant, a giant in the manufacturing of fiber for telecom, but also manufacturing in the specialty fiber for sensing, OFS. And if you need microstructuring, if you need a special fiber assembly, if you need a fiber welding, if you need a splice, Nai Force, Nai Force, all the way from Sweden, the our partner of choice. And my partner of choice is Dr. Ana Gonzalez. Congratulations on the fantastic job you've done with this industry. The, tell us, tell us what's in the menu. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jose, for your kind introduction. So, yes, I'm very happy to be here today to talk about sensors for the oil and gas industry. So as you can see in this agenda, we will have uh, the key players in the development of these kind of sensors to share their vision about the future and the current, current needs of these technologies. And to answer about how we are going to face these needs and requirements, we have here the entire supply chain in photonics offering the state of the art in new fiber fabrication, IR detectors, squatting, uh, lasers, and all required components and services to build a photonic sensor for the oil and gas industry. And yes, and also, I also would like to mention some of the European initiatives that we are uh, that are participating in this meeting, such as a Photon Hub that supports European companies that are not expert in photonics to develop new products based on photonic technologies uh, with financial and business coaching and also technical training. Uh, also, we have PixUp, a pile online that offers standard packaging and assembly solutions for photonic integrated circuits with focus on developing processes that are compatible with a larger volume manufacturing. Mirfab, which offers prototyping of mid infrared optical modules for chemical sensing, and Jepix, that provides support to innovative businesses to go from prototyping to pre commercial production of indium phosphide chips. Well, regarding JPEX, uh, I have some news. So I would like to announce that if you have a breakout idea uh, and you are target, targeting of uh, indium phosphide photonic integrated circuits to take it to production, we have a huge opportunity for your company. So send us your idea and you may be awarded with a 50% of discount on the manufacturing services of JPEX including a state-of-the-art big fabrication by Smart Photonics, for example. And this offer is only for European uh, SMEs. 
So yes, please uh, contact us if you are. Fifty percent discount for all European SMEs if you have a good idea to manufacture it in Indian phosphate technology. That means being epic, and that means being part of the Epic Spiral line. I would like to remind everyone that this slide only corresponds to the companies that registered for participating in the meeting today. If you're an Epic member and you miss your logo in this slide, maybe you are right, but you simply did not register. We never forget about your technology because at the end of the day. This is our job. I also would like to remind everyone that this meeting is also shown live in YouTube. So hello, YouTubers. Thank you very much for joining the meeting today. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo at epic-asoc.com, and I will be more than happy to make that introduction. And also, please make sure that you use the chat when you are watching the video, because I would like to read your questions directly into the Zoom room. This is, of course, also valid for people with me in the Zoom room today. If you have any anything to tell to each other, use use the private chat and do it secretly and make sure that you make the right connections during the presentations. At the same time, if after the meeting you didn't get to talk to the right person at the meeting, please send me an email, jose.pozo at epic-aso.com and I will formulate that particular introduction. And with 10 minutes gone, I think it's time. I think it's time to kick off this meeting. And for kicking off this meeting, I have the pleasure to announce our first speaker today. We go to one of the big brands in oil and gas solution provider. We go to a company that we all want to do business with. We go to Halliburton. Glenn Wilson, product manager of Halliburton, thank you very much for taking the role of kicking off this fantastic meeting today, the floor and the attention of everyone all around the world here in Zoom and in YouTube goes to you, Glenn. Glenn Wilson, you know the sentence of Epic 2021? I think you are muted. Yes, sir. We may have a bit of problem with the internet connection. It should be unmuted now. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. A slideshow mode, okay, please. Just... And you are ready to rock. The floor is yours. Okay, fantastic. And thank you, uh, thank you everybody. And uh, thank you, Epic, for the opportunity to present. Glenn, I think we may have some connectivity problems. It's good that TE connectivity register for this meeting, so if they can solve it, it's great. But uh, jokes apart, why don't we move to the second speaker and afterwards we come back, we come back to... Oh. Let's... Sorry, was I here there? Yes, I'm here, Glenn. Oh. I okay, think... sorry, I, I just had a connection to set a reset, so I can keep going if you'd like. Okay, please, please keep going. Okay. All right, so as mentioned, thanks. I'll kick off on just giving an overview of fiber optics for subsea development. So within oil and gas, obviously, we can uh, speak around um, onshore developments, you know, various offshore developments. And particularly as we look in, in offshore, we have a combination of platform developments as well as um, what we call subsea. And, um, and so subsea takes into, into account different uh, sorts of project scopes, everything from uh, shelf developments, for example, for example, Norwegian continental shelf through to, uh, through to deep water developments, um, right the way through to the ultra deep water developments. And so a key driver here is the fact that the industry is seeing, uh, seeing growth um, around, the, uh, around subsea and in particular, uh, we're actually seeing um, uh, basically uh, uh, commitments on behalf of operators that are uh, exceeding some of the, uh, the pre-2014 uh, downturn. So a lot of activity going in the subsea. This is driving interest around, uh, for example, subsea uh, distributed acoustic sensing. And one of the primary rationales here is that we're able to develop a, a lower total cost of ownership solution um, for, uh, for, for, for seismic monitoring of reservoirs. And this is work that's been published uh, actually going back quite a few years initially on dry trees. 
um, by uh, both Shell and BP. Uh, this is an example from the Mars development in the Gulf of Mexico. Key point here is that DAS is able to yield ocean bottom node equivalent type images. The other thing is, well, that, that kind of beyond seismic, there's a whole host of interest in what's going on in the reservoir itself. And so this enables, for example, the use of dual trip completions, where we actually have a lower completion string, which generates uh, uh, data within the reservoir. So, you know, one of the pretty things of doing this life that this can happen and every day is a fantastic adventure. So what we're going to do is enjoy this adventure all together and leave Halliburton for them to solve the problem. What they are doing really today is answering the epic question. So what we're going to do is going to put them at the end of the meeting as the last presentation, just to make sure that you all stay till the end. And in the meantime, we're going to go to one of my favorite countries in the world. We go to Denmark and we go to one of the success stories of the European ecosystem. We go to NK. Photonics, Martin Lapping, senior sales manager from NKT Photonics. The, his, the, the, the history of success super continuum on fiber, la fiber lasers, the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, I hope I can contribute with uh, some interesting topics as well as a stable connection. It's sometimes a bit challenging, admittedly. And uh, let's see where it goes. You should see my slides right now. I see them crystal clear. The floor is yours. Excellent. Excellent. So again, thank you very much, Jose, uh, Anna, and Elena for uh, enabling this great meeting and for having having me with you. It's it's a great pleasure, actually. And um, yes, actually, my name is Martin Lagging. Um, I'm just trying to move the slides here, which doesn't function. That's interesting. There we go. Um, my name is Martin Lagging. I'm with NKT Photonics since around two and a half years now, and I'm supporting our OEM customers worldwide for the specific Coheras product line. These are the ultra narrow, ultra low noise fiber lasers. But let's start from the bigger picture. Who are we? Where are we located? And what, what are we doing in fact? So there is this ancient old, uh, company called NKT. It was founded 130 years ago. Uh, the interesting story here is the founder of the company, he was in the US. He met in person Thomas Edison, and he was so fascinated uh, of what he saw there that he went back to Denmark and immediately started creating his own company, producing uh, fibers and cables, and starting to electrify uh, first Copenhagen, and I think after that, entire Europe. So, the company, the parental company, consists of two independent companies. This is NKT, and it's NKT Photonics, where I belong to. So the bigger brother here is NKT, clearly, as you can see, with a revenue of more than a billion euro annually and more than 3,800 employees. These guys are still heavily in the fiber business. They produce the fibers for high, medium, low voltage and energy. They run their own vessel and deploy these fibers all around the world, uh, subsea level and terrestrial as well. At NKT, we are specialized on fiber lasers and fibers. So we, for example, produce photonic crystal fibers. These are delivering large amounts of power and a br very broad range of wavelengths and are very, very uh, commonly used in industry when you need to deliver most of power possible. Then we also have a second product line. These are the ultra fast lasers for material processing, for marking, engraving, for ophthalmology and lots of medical applications. We have the ultra broadband light sources, the super continuum light sources, which I would call the best replacement of, of a bulb and they are used in very fascinating areas like food sorting, but also in the most sophisticated microscopes found today. Um, and then we have the, just the opposite. That's the ultra narrow line with ultra low noise fiber lasers of the Kravas product line. And this is where I want to elaborate today. And these are the lasers that are used in DAS applications. So distributed acoustic fiber sensing. I should mention, of course, that 
Now, the guys missing today from NKT are my colleagues from LEOS. LEOS is our facility in Cologne, and they are specialized on DTS, distributed temperature sensing and strain. This is a technology that where we heard that it's quite frequently used also in oil and gas and, and downhole applications, but it's also deployed in tunnels, in theaters, in buildings as a very sophisticated fire alarm systems. Um, but we don't build dust systems. We build the lasers for these systems. And this is where I want to take you next. This is the DAS fiber sensing applications specifically used in oil and gas industry. So let's start with the most demanding. That's the permanent reservoir monitoring applications, PRM. This is a seismic technology where all the components, subsea components are 100% optical. So these systems are a, a very large grid of hundreds and maybe thousands of individual sensors on the sea floor, can be very deep, can be more than a thousand meters uh, of depth, and they cover several square kilometers of area. So typically here you have the highest demand in sensitivity and range. It's thousands of kilometers of fiber, remember that. So you need usually multiple wavelengths, light sources, and because it's seismic, you need to detect low frequencies. So you need the best, best available lasers that provide all, all uh, these specifications that work at low frequencies and just offer the best, lowest noise you can imagine. Then we have the downhole applications. Here, you don't have the long range necessarily. You just need the best possible sensitivities to see all the effects uh, underground, right? And these, I have to mention this and did already, they are often combined with DTS systems. Yeah, so diff two different kinds of fiber detection systems in, in these applications. Last but not least, there's of course the pipeline monitoring because all, the, all that oil and gas, we saw it already in the trailer sort of, it needs to be transported and we need safe pipelines. And I believe that today the best system to, maintain, to, to secure the pipeline's health is DAS. Yeah. So all that you need to do, um, let me maybe say DAS, this technology is interferometric. The whole fiber acts as a sensor. You shine into the fiber and collect the reflecting light and do interferometry. You only need to access one end of the fiber and these fibers can be 100 kilometers long or longer. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this from the integrators in this presentation. Um, so pipeline monitoring is a very nice application as well. So on the next slide, I want to, to give you a few uh, topics around, all the, uh, around those coherence lasers that we offer. Maybe let's start bottom up here. Uh, during the past 25 years, we have delivered around 20,000 lasers. And my rough guess is that around half of them are sitting somewhere in this world on oil rigs, in deserts, on mountains, in industrial applications, in very harsh environments. And these lasers, they have to survive. So they have to be durable. And I can tell you, we usually really don't see them back. So very bad business for us because they last very long. So reliability certainly is a, is a key here. Uh, of course, considering the cost of ownership, right? Because in these very uh, demanding conditions, you cannot afford to use lasers that somehow have the stigma of being uh, units that usually break, right? Lasers, they, many people have the perception that lasers are complicated devices. Uh, you shouldn't even touch them. Not our lasers, they are really, really rugged. So it's, we make it easy for any integrator to use the lasers. Um, they, we offer a perfect software development kit with all the lab view drivers that you need. So it's very easy to use them in your systems. We offer the typical wavelengths of ytterbium and erbium. So one micron, 1.5 micron. And the key of these lasers is ultra low phase noise. This is the parameter that is most important for DAS applications. So I won't go into details on every single line here. Let us maybe look at this picture and remember the applications that I mentioned. We have the permanent reservoir monitoring. This is the most demanding applications. Here we use our technology. Oops, sorry, I have to go back. 
Here we use our technology and even further stabilize it externally in this one compact package. This is the basic product line, the basic X15 being our, our state of the art laser. And these, these modules slide into our acoustic racks. That's how we call them. You see them here. And here you can slide in up to 16 different lasers, different wavelengths for your, for example, PRM uh, application. You can use individual outputs or we can uh, multiplex them into one output fiber. Then if we go to downhole or to pipeline monitoring, remember that the lower wave, uh, the lower frequencies are essential for seismic applications. Here, it really pays back if you have a stabilized laser. In principle, the micro package is the one that you want to use when you use uh, the pipeline monitoring uh, where you want to integrate at the smallest possible level. We used to say this has the size of an iPhone 6. I should move to iPhone 12 nowadays, but maybe that's too big. Uh, anyhow, this is a very tiny laser and um, it offers at the higher frequencies exactly the same quality and low noise as the X15 lasers. Let's move to the last slide where I want to, to depict some of the details I mentioned in, in a bit more detail. So here you see the smallest package, Micro E15, for pipeline monitoring and, and downhold. And you see that the, the phase noise, the key parameter at a higher frequencies of 20 kilohertz is basically the same for the Micro E15 and the high-end X15. But when you look at the 100 hertz, and it could, can go down to 10 or 1 hertz, you see the, the great benefit of stabilizing this laser a bit more. Right? What I also want to mention is that we found that um, usually you have to amplify these, these, um, these lasers. We offer some, some output power around 40, 30, 40 milliwatt, which is a lot considering the quality of the source. But sometimes you need to amplify them and you don't want to sacrifice your very valuable phase noise, your low phase noise. So we have introduced recently the Boostic amplifiers product line, which slide into the same package, into the same 3U platform, the acoustic platform as the X15s. So you can uh, amplify up to two watt without sacrificing these very nice parameters out here. And this is where I want to move to my very last slide. And as you can see here, I want to already answer in advance the typical epical questions. What can you do for us? What can we do for you? And so what can you do for us first? This is quite, quite simple. Uh, we are around 400 people at NKT Photonics and 150 of these people are engineers. Yeah? And this sometimes is a little bit like hen and egg. You have these engineers and someone has a brilliant idea and builds a laser that just didn't exist before. You have you have specifications that are unseen in this world, but you don't have an application for it. Yeah? So the specs are there, not the application, and not the application. And then you have another, another expert who sees this and says, yeah, this is exactly what I was waiting for. And something like this happens, happened when fiber sensing was developed. You need, you need these kinds of light sources. Without the laser, there's not the technology. Without this technology, yeah. So it, it always comes together. This is what I would call hen and egg. But of course, we don't do this only for our personal, personal pleasure. We want to build the best lasers in the world, but the only thing that counts for us at the end that has an impact is when it's you who integrate them into your fantastic systems uh, and really change the world together with us. So what we ask you, what can you do for us? Give us your feedback. Uh, tell us what you need from us. We love to play with our lasers and we will very gladly tailor them to your needs. And what can we do for you? Well, we can provide you these fantastic lasers for your demanding applications. Thank you very much, Martin. Very nice presentation. And I think we already much. have a couple of questions uh, in, the, in the chat. So Amir from CSEM, yep. would you Thanks. like to make the questions by yourself? Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Maybe we can get a feedback. So actually, this is a you know kind of question maybe to all the panelists, you know, not just uh, Martin, but uh, it's actually you know you talk nicely about the you know DAS and then the requirement for like high sensitivity. I was wondering if you see a sort of a, 
uh, like a long term, you know, market uh, for point sensors, like you know, ac optical accelerometers for PRM applications. And what is can you quantify the sensitivity requirements? I don't know, maybe nano, like you know, wh where what is the you know, like you know, the sort of you know, as Jose was wants to say, is like in you know, a Christmas feature of sensitivity. Uh, that is actually required in this piece is nano G sensitivity, 10 nano G, what the sensor developers actually have to target. Yeah, actually, I have to say that I personally cannot answer this question. This is something that would go to, to our partners who integrate our lasers into these systems. So I'd, I'd have to ask, for example, our colleague from Halliburton, who could maybe answer this. Okay, we can come back to this question later because it's an interesting one. Um, you, you had another question, right, Amir? Okay. Yes, uh, I mean, no, uh, well, I mean, the, the second uh, actually is, you know, from, from one of my, uh, you know, colleagues is that the minimum phase voice for a DAS system at 40 kilometer for distributed sensing, what is, you know, so for minimum phase voice you can, phase noise you can achieve? Well, actually, this is a question that, that we ask our customers and our partners and, and we never get a clear answer. Yeah. So let's say what I can tell you is that for the, I would call it medium range to long range, 40 kilometers, uh, the, the lasers that we offer are perfectly well suited for this. Yeah. So let's say if I can, I can offer sending you a data sheet or something where you see the detailed specs, I've, I've shown them on the slides as well. So this is exactly what, what you need for 40 kilometers or even more. With, with our lasers, you can easily go to 80 or maybe 100 kilometers, just looking at the light source, the quality of the light source. Good. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to answer your question afterwards. Ah, very good, yes, go ahead. Hello? No, you, you muted. Oh, okay, if you have time, then. Uh, in this industry, there is no tomorrow. There is no afterwards. If you can answer the question, please do it right now. All right. Yes, I mean, um, in terms of, um, I guess, um, uh, what is it we are measuring? You know, the fiber, the DAS measures the uh, dynamic strain. And if you want, I can share my screen quickly. So, um, but without stealing too much time. Um, so I don't know whether you could see my screen. It's coming. Yeah, so it's that's what actually you're measuring. So we're actually measuring the um, allongation along the fiber, so between two points. And then by taking the next laser, we can measure this at another time. So we have two operators, one with time, one with displacements. So um, just briefly, then if you have a seismic wave, then what you're doing, you're actually then modeling this as a particle motion because you're moving the strain. And essentially by applying or multiplying the strain by the wave equation, then you can actually get geophone equivalent units. And if you look at the conversion from the strain to, um, from the phase to a strain, you could relate it to these equations and these are all documented. And then you can compare it to the geophones now, with the standard fiber, we are not as sensitive as geophone, but there are ways to improve that. And if you look at, for example, um, I can show you my after my presentation a, a plot which compared it to seismometers, you know, the sensitivity. But you know, with the new enhancement with the fibers, you can actually get better performance than geophone. So Amir, does that answer your question regarding DAS? It is great to have Silixa, one of the success stories of DAS in the room. Amir? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a very like an interesting discussion because uh, you know, I'd love to actually chat a little bit more with you, Mahmoud, later on if you have time because this is exactly the type of uh, sort of discussion I was looking for. He, he gave us some spoilers. I can't wait for the <laughs> presentation. But first, we have some questions from Lit in the room. Stephen, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, it's actually kind of a build to, uh, to Martin's comment or his ask. And it comes actually from a colleague uh, from, uh, from BP that I have a, the pleasure of actually sitting on a, a team for uh, distributed fiber optic deployments for BP with. Uh, unfortunately, she's on, uh, on holiday today, so unable to join us. But uh, she kind of had a challenge, which it kind of goes to, to Martin as well as the integrators. And that is, uh, you know, the, 
the potential, the capabilities of modularizing laser source and such to place in the well bore. So currently, obviously, we're, we're shooting from the surface down through umbilicals, through wet, wet connects and everything else. Uh, so her challenge is, is there anyone out there that has a vision or a, a concept to take this and actually place it in the well bore more to uh, a, a two trip completion? And that kind of is driven by uh, the belief that they, uh, we believe we could get electronic continuity across the, the upper and lower completion. But the, the gap right now is currently in the fiber optic wet, wet connect to make that jump. So we know there's nothing out there currently, but that this particular team member would be interested in speaking to anybody that might have a concept. Obviously, it sounds like uh, Martin's, uh, Martin's team might have a, a really good laser source, but that will be have to, have to be coupled with, with, uh, with something else uh, to make all that happen. So that's just kind of a challenge out there. If anyone has an interest in pursuing that, please reach out to me. I'll put you in contact with this, uh, with this individual over at BP, and you can carry that conversation on with, on with her and, uh, and see where it goes. But uh, it's a big challenge, and uh, it sounds like, uh, obviously, there's a lot of great companies here at Epic, so perhaps uh, someone out there has a, has a means to meet it. Steven, I want to come back to you after the presentation from FIBO Subtip because I want to discuss the challenge, the challenge of data and making the invisible visible with software is something that Lit has excelled. So thank you very, very much for being with us this afternoon. Anna, please allow me, I have a question in the YouTube universe, all the way from the YouTube universe, Daviden Barsuita, he's from Lenair UK. They make assemblies for electronics and also special connectors for fibers in oil and gas. He has a question question for NKT. Do you face any challenges regarding very high power handling with fiber optic connectors? Well, admittedly, uh, the connector, the question of connecting or uh, connecting fibers is really something that I would have to, to transfer to our engineers. <laughs> um, I'm not aware of any, any um, real challenge as of today, whenever I talk with my with my in-house colleagues, um, I'm not aware of, of a big question that is right there in the room that we cannot answer. But if there's any any um, suggestions you have, please connect with me. With me, I will connect you with the right people here. Uh, I'm unfortunately not the right one to answer that. I'm. I'm not playing with fibers often enough. <laughs> but you are the right entry point to the success story NKT. So offline, exactly. I'm going to introduce you to Davinder so you can forward him to the right person to answer that question and have a follow up. But now, why don't we move to the agenda? The next presentation, the next presentation is one of the success stories of Europe. Do you know the Genoa Bridge? Do you know that the Genoa Bridge was actually uh, installed a system for for a structural health monitoring with four EPIC members, Somni, who have Renko in the room. We have, of course, uh, Silex, we have JHT, GEHT, and we have Luna Innovations, four EPIC members working together to wire with fiber optics the Genoa Bridge so the disaster doesn't happen again. Let's hear from Luna Innovations. And I have my very good friend, Ian Shannon, to take the role of telling us, telling us how we can help Luna being even greater than already is. The, Epic question will be at the end, but first, tell us about you. Ian, the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. We see the slides crystal clear. I wish with your sound is even better. Everything works perfectly. Okay. You can see everything okay? Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Shannon. I'm Vice President of Sales for Luna Innovations uh, here in EMEA. And uh, I'd like to thank EPIC, um, Jose and Anna for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I'd like to start off just, uh, I know I'm limited to my six minutes, so uh, I'll, I'll rush through most of these. But um, I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about the story of how Luna got to where we are today as what is now the largest fiber optic sensing company in the world. Um, we began uh, in between 1990 and 2003 developing systems as contract engineers, developing optical systems amongst other things and developing IP and products and either then commercializing those or taking them to market. Uh, and in some cases, creating uh, small spin-off businesses which we would ultimately sell on. 
Um, one of those was a company that we developed an OFDR based uh, FBG interrogator for draw tower gratings, which uh, ended up as Baker Hughes. And that was back in the uh, early 2000s. So at that time, fiber optic sensing wasn't a huge market. So we kind of focused the products back into the telecom world until 2005, when we introduced another OFDR based system that has very high spatial, very low spatial resolution, but over short ranges. So anything with one millimeter resolution over 70 meters. And that broke us into the uh, early adopters and research institutes doing uh, distributed sensing with high resolution. And we continue to do that as well as develop the company and go public over a course of the few next years. And then we introduced a sensing only product, which does exactly the same thing, uses an OFDR technique or standard Rayleigh backscatter fiber and interrogating that with millimeter resolution, again, along the short lengths. And then in parallel to that, another sister company or a, a competitor at that time, or who we thought was a competitor, Micron Optics introduced a product called the Hyperion. And in 2017, 2018, sorry, we actually acquired Micron Optics and then integrated them into the Luna Fold, into the Luna family. And just last year in December, to round that off, we acquired OptiSense. OptiSense, as many people will know, are the big players in the world of DAS. So Luna now has a Rayleigh sensing system for short range. We have FBGs for longer range and higher speed. And we have a DAS system which can be used, in this case, we're gonna talk about oil and gas. So which markets do we play in? Well, in the oil and gas space, we play in the subsea, in production monitoring, in uh, bore diagnostics. We also play in the reservoir monitoring. So we do a lot of seismology, a lot of geo stuff. And we also have DAS systems for monitoring uh, cables and subsea cables and wind. I should mention that at the same time, because it's still energy and also in the pipeline and railway, se railway sector. So again, using really signaling, uh, really scatter, I should say, really scatter to measure the acoustic effect on the fiber and then presenting the customer. And this is the important part, not just data that shows that the fiber moved here or the fiber moved there, but what was the event? Was it someone uh, tampering with the, the pipeline? Was it an event that caused an impact? So we actually take the data and present actionable data to the customer. Geothermal is another area we all should touch on. I know this, this diagram shows a power station, but it's equally true for um, fracking and fracturing. And again, in geotechnical measurements, we provide the ability to measure the fracture, the production monitoring, and the reservoirs themselves. So I want to take one particular example, and this is not using DAS, but this is using fiber brag gratings. And uh, as you know, anyone in oil and gas, FPSOs, there seem to be on the growth at the moment. And the, the first graph, the first slide that we saw from Halliburton earlier showed that the, the 125 meter, the, so the, the short depth seems to be the area where there is more investment. And what we do with uh, FPSOs is monitor the integrity of the flexible risers. So there are a number of points in a flexible riser that are vulnerable to damage at the top on the surface where the sun's heating it and the bend stiffener to prevent you know, the top of this, the ocean is usually where the, the most friction and most movement happens. And then there's the weight itself, the fatigue that happens in the pipe, the buoyancy modules that increase the temperature where the jackets are wrapped around and also the abrasion and friction that happens at the geo level on the ground on the subsea. So when you look at a flexible riser, it's actually quite a complex structure. But over time, there are areas of weakness that can cause various uh, failures. And it's useful, if not essential, for the operator to know where these events are and do something about it before they happen, before a catastrophic fracture or a leak happens. So the kind of things that can happen is that the uh, There'll be a collapse in the carcass in the center. The, the, the coating on the outside, the protective coating can split, or it can, be, you know, it can be stripped by anything that catches against it. So you can see there's a whole list of, I don't need to read them out to you, you can see them. There's a whole list of things that can go wrong. 
So what we do is we take our Hyperion system and install that on the FPSO. Someone mentioned WetMate connectors and there are partners that provide these. And then we install the FBGs on the wires that are on the armor inside the flexible riser and then provide the data to the top side to allow the operators to see what's happening on their flexible riser. And typically on an FPSO, there'll be multiple risers. There's not just one. And I see a picture of an installation here. This one here, you can see there are actually seven Hyperion systems there, each one with 16 channels, each one monitoring 16 fibers simultaneously on a flexible riser. Each one of them is hooked to an individual riser. And this is installed and runs 24 seven on the FPSO, providing valuable data to the end customer to protect their assets. I'd like to thank you for your time. And I would like to thank you for a great presentation. And I would like to ask you what I'm sure you know what's coming, the epic question. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Well, what, the, what we can do for you is provide you an end-to-end -end solution for uh, anything to do with uh, downhaul uh, or right to the domestic property in any way, shape, or form using fiber optics. Um, we are a major player in the fiber optic sensing market, but also in the world of communications. And very often these two things go hand in hand. Um, what you can do for us is for all the oil and gas companies and operators there, we're more than happy to work with you uh, to provide these solutions uh, tailored to what you require, whether it's onshore, offshore, under the sea or on the surface. All right. So you know what? I like challenges. So why don't we go to one of these oil and gas companies and we ask them what they are doing here today. Let's go to Ray from BP. Ray, thank you very much for being with us today. I would like for you first to say hello to all of us and also maybe you can tell us what brought you to this meeting and what kind of cooperations we can start. Hey guys, uh, listen, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, it's really uh, um, amazing to see the number of players in the, in the Epic. This is my first uh, first time uh, uh, first time at this at a, such a, a, a such a forum. So we're we're currently looking at uh, our our primary um, uh, goal at the minute is we're 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 really interested in DAS. We're we're looking nice to deploying DAS um, in. Uh, Deep water, land systems, um, uh, rig-based systems. We're also interested in uh, DTS for uh, for pipeline and router monitoring as well. But our main focus at the minute is uh, is uh, uh, downhole fiber optic DAS, and um, we just recently uh, had had our first successful uh, deep water uh, deployment. Um, but what we are what we are now looking at at how we can uh, how we can uh, apply this technology to long distance, you know, over 150 kilometers, um, and so really, I'm really just glad to be here, uh, and uh, just really glad to see uh, the various uh, players from the from the interrogators, lasers, fibers, connectors, and uh, system analysis companies. And this is just the beginning. Stay tuned for what's coming from Silixa, from Phoebus Optics, on the DAS. And I really want I really want to help you on this. So after the meeting, I, I really want people to connect with you and to find ways to collaborate. Uh, before that, I would like to go to one system integrator the here, and I want to hear their perspective. We had Denkong Focal in the room from the beautiful country of the Netherlands. Albert, Huye Medag, thank you yeah. very much for being with us this afternoon. Yeah. Tell us how we can help you and tell us what is Denkon, a big system integrator doing yeah. in the oil and gas market. Yeah, so that, thank you for, uh, um, for this question. Um, yeah, well, in set, set of uh, fiber optics, we're not using fiber optics in the oil and gas market, but um, we have developed uh, for one customer and and a flow cell in which we could measure the content of the fuel. And that's also a nice application of the photonics uh, uh, world. Um, and that was using a spectroscopy, NIST spectroscopy, uh, measuring um, yet uh, fame and ethanol and water content. And that was, yeah, they could use it for, a, um, a, a, let's say, a platform, an oil platform. 
uh, to measure the content of the of the fuel. So that was also a nice example, and is nowadays being uh, used and is in in the in the field for for tests for trials. Albert, is there any challenge, any room for cooperation, any item in the Santa Claus Christmas list that I could connect you and make you happy with? Yeah, so I think the challenge is not only the optics part, it's also uh, the data that comes back from, uh, from the center. Huh? So what are you doing with the data and how can you learn from that data? Um, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a big data question, actually. You can get all the data from uh, from the, your centers, you get all the data from your uh, uh, platforms, and then you need to do something with the data. I think that is one of the challenges we are... Uh, so it's maybe not optics, but it's, it is a challenge. There's a question for you, Albert, coming all the way from Hydroptics, uh, yeah. one of the big EU projects right now innovating on this segment. Sarkis, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. What's on your mind? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, do you hear me? I hope loud and clear. Yes. But yes. we cannot see you. Switch on your camera. Don't oh yes, don't I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, you perfect. See? Yes, yes. Hi everyone. I just had a quick question. What type of lasers are you using for your spectroscopy? What wavelength? Uh, is it semiconductor? Is yeah, it it's in a near wavelength, and it's a uh, it's a halogen light source. So it's a small halogen light source we use, and the spectroscopy system. Well, it's a, just a, a um, state of the art, but it's a very low cost in that sense. So it's actually a spectrometer with a with a filter system on it. So it, it has to be low cost. Uh, that's very important. Uh, but in this particular case, it has to be developed such that it is also ATEX proofed. So we need to do all kinds of tricks to get it really ATEX proofed. Uh, but yeah. yeah, so low cost, low cost stuff. Okay, low great. cost, high quality stuff, of course. But I want to now go to one of the R&D centers here in the room. We go to IEP, Teresa Canelas. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. You have a question. I think you have a question for Luna. What's on your mind? Teresa Hello. Canelas. Yes. yes, sorry, I, um, I wasn't having my phone connected, uh, my microphone. Um, your camera is also not connected and we really want to see you, so ah. don't be shy. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't work, so okay, that's I try. Go ahead. I, I'm trying to connect it, but it goes, it goes. Um, 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 the question I have um, is regarding the noise evaluations. I would like to know uh, if there is any solution to to noise evaluation, uh, for instance, for a power substation. Um, or for for city noise, for instance, um, what what kind of solution do you have? Ian, what kind of solutions do you have for noise evaluation? Oh, good question. Thank you for that. Um, are you talking about um, city noise, as in you know traffic and uh, vibration? For instance, yes. For instance, because the the main the main uh, source of problems of noise in the city is, uh, of course, uh, the traffic, uh, the 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 road road traffic. Um, yep. So yes. Well, I, I think for um, longer range uh, noise and traffic monitoring, certainly a dash system uh, would be effective. Um, we, we have uh, systems like that already installed for both road and rail uh, mm -hmm. or infrastructure ones. Um, and likewise, depending on the localization that you need, um, if it's um, longer range, then yeah, DAS is perfectly suited. If it's um, shorter range or specific locations, then accelerometers would be an ideal option mm -hmm. too. So you base your system on uh, on measuring the vibration or acceleration of the, and then you perform the, the transformation into noise. Is that, yeah. uh, is that correct? Yeah, there's a number of ways. One of them, if, if it was a, a, an accelerometer based system, then there are FBG accelerometers on the market. Um, we have one that uses an, uh, an ex extrinsic Fabry Pro interferometer. Um, that is also used for uh, measuring uh, vibration. And in fact, mm -hmm. some, along with the ones from our colleague and friend who's going to be talking in a little while, I think from Somni, are the ones installed in the, uh, the bridge in Geneva for, uh, for that very purpose. Mm -hmm. For instance, for, uh, because um, this is particular, uh, particular, um, particularly relevant um, on power substations, 
regarding the AMC problems. Um, fiber optic sensors would be an asset uh, for measuring noise coming from the transformer. Um, it's the, the, the DAS system also good for this? Um, for the transformers in a power station, um, yeah. if you want, you're wanting to measure the environment surrounding the power mm -hmm. station, yes, that would be ideal. If you want to measure closer to the premises and, you know, and try to isolate the source more closely, then probably accelerometers would be the best option. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, all the you. way from Portugal, from the Instituto Electronico Portugués, <laughs> IEP. Teresa, we yes. just heard from Somni. And we have here the CEO of Somni Solutions. We have Renko Nieuwland, all the way also from beautiful Netherlands. Renko, uh, what do you do? And what kind of connections can we make at this meeting? Rai from BP is going to be very interested in talking to you afterwards. Hi, Jose. Thanks for, uh, for the kind introduction. Yeah, um, so we are from Somni. We, we develop um, very nice fiber optic sensors based on fiber break ratings. They, they interface very well with the, uh, the Hyperion from, from, from IEM. Um, so one of the things which we develop are and, and produce are accelerometers for, uh, based on uh, fiber break ratings, which could work quite well in your, um, in your transformer application. So mm -hmm. It could be Perfect. a good intro could be a nice uh, topic to, uh, to discuss. There, there is a lot of discussions to do. And you know what? We have a surprise yeah. for you. We did this already mm -hmm. last week, and it was great. After the meeting at 5 o'clock, you will receive a link in the chat here in the Zoom channel. All you have to do is click on that link and close the Zoom window. We will all appear in something called wonder.me, which is wonderful. Actually, you will be a bubble, and we'll make sure that you connect with the right people, and you will meet our colleague from BP, right? You will meet uh, the person from Civil. You will make the right connections. This is what this means is all about. And now I would like to go to a one thing that we started talking about it and I want to clarify further. There is a, in the companies who are targeting photonic integrated circuits for interrogators, there's a huge platform and huge opportunities for that. We have JPEX in the room and I would like to know a bit more how JPEX is going to revolutionize, revolutionize the way people access in the Infos fight for interrogators fiber optics. For that, we have Vadim. Vadim, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, good morning. So you would how like are you going to help uh, my friends? Yeah, uh, with, with JPEX, basically, we have uh, an open call for uh, demonstrators. So I will share the screen. Uh, wait a second. First time I'm sharing. Yes. So basically, if uh, you have an idea, uh, we can discuss your idea and uh, you can take part in the open call. And uh, we can also support the idea for small and medium enterprises and basically bring the, your optical system into the chip and uh, also package it uh, with other partners. So, yeah, so basically we are all about integration and helping in all the aspects along the way to get your uh, device packaged. Yeah. All of you, you can notice by now how interested Epic is in making sure that the next photonic technology is manufactured in Europe. Please help us, help us doing that. If you have any idea, please contact Anna, contact Vading, 50% discount on manufacturing services so you get manufacturing in Europe. European Commission is behind us all this. And now, with the meeting already going, with all of us full of energies, only one hour to go, I would like to go to one of the success stories of DAS and DTS. We all want to hear if we can make this company even really greater than already is. I met them at Adipec in Saudi Arabia last year. I love what they do. Victor Servet from Phoebus Optics. Tell us how we can make Phoebus even greater. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much, Jose. Uh, I'll just go and share my screen. Uh, that should come up. Tell me if it's all good. It came up. It's all good. Okay, perfect. So uh, hello, everybody, and thanks again, uh, Jose. So um, as you said, I'm going to be presenting uh, Phoebus Optics, so uh, distributed fiber uh, sensing of, uh, interrogators, and uh, specifically for topics around uh, oil and gas and uh, solutions that can be needed. So just a presentation of uh, who we are. 
So we are a manufacturer of innovative and specifically a state-of-the-art distributed optical fiber sensing solution. Our aim is really to have the best possible technical solution for our clients, of course, both in acquisition and in data analysis and data viewing for the, in terms of software so that the, the data can really be useful. Uh, we've been founded in uh, 2015, but we're uh, growing uh, very quickly. We have uh, more than 50% uh, of uh, increase in uh, revenue each year since 2017, and uh, we're now more than 30 employees. We're based uh, in France, so in both of our France, where we have a head office and a test facility, which I'll, uh, I'll talk a bit about because it could be uh, interesting for some people, with some um, other locations for uh, Commercial, uh, commercial points in Houston, in Tennessee, and in the Middle East that is going to come up soon. Uh, so we are very strong in the production with a high focus on quality, of course, that led us to get the ISO 9001 uh, certification. And uh, we keep a very strong R&D uh, focus as well in order to, uh, to really keep uh, state-of-the-art performances. We are... Um, forces or we have mostly engineers and uh, doctors in optics and electronics uh, software to really stay on top uh, technically so that we're sure that we have uh, some of the best technology available and uh, that goes of course with all that is uh, all the patents that goes with it so i had a slide uh, going a bit in technology but of course i won't go into it in details as uh, ian and um, martin said uh, we are working with a uh, distributed fiber optics so like this so we can use uh, an optical cable that has a distributed sensor and um, using a backscattered signal, we can come back to different uh, uh, information such as acoustics, what we call dust, temperature for DTS and strain as well. The, uh, yeah, some, uh, some benefits of our units can be, of course, that we only need only one end. And uh, specifically, we have a very, very long range. So we, with a single unit, we can, uh, on a single channel, we can go for more than 200 kilometers. Uh, we, uh, while using our range extender modules that we developed uh, once again to, to be state of the art in terms of uh, range. Not going into details, but uh, we have developed systems, uh, as uh, Jose said, in uh, DAS, where we are very proud of our performances, where we are down to eight pico strains in terms of noise law. We can go for more than 50 kilometers and uh, compatible with our range extender, which can double or triple this. We also work with DTS with both uh, Briwan and Raman uh, solutions so that we, have, we can really propose a full spectrum of solutions. And if uh, in terms of, uh, if there is a need for a field measurement, we have a, a, a system that is really made, they built into a pedicase case that is really meant to go on site so that you can uh, just uh, easy, uh, easily go on site, make a measurement and come, uh, come back home. It's not the lab equipment, it's uh, really directly robust, able to be on site. So in terms of uh, application uh, specifically for oil and gas, we work with, uh, of course, uh, various, uh, um, uh, various uh, applications. So of course, we are in, uh, in the wells for uh, geophysics and uh, um, uh, geothermics, uh, oil uh, producing uh, wells. It can be for uh, seismic applications such as uh, VSP, vertical seismic profiling using DAS. But it can also be for production using, for example, uh, DTS or DAS or both at the same time as to optimize everything. Perimeter security as well for, uh, for specific uh, locations. Of course, if there is a very sensitive uh, perimeter to be pr protected, using a DAS solution can allow you to do um, uh, some uh, intrusion detection to make sure that uh, nobody comes in when they weren't supposed to. And also a pipeline uh, and uh, surf, so uh, subsea uh, umbilical riser and flow lines, all the onshore and uh, subsea lines. It can be for leak detection, for third party intrusion to make sure that nothing bad happens to the, uh, for example, the buried pipe. Strain on soil movement as well to make sure that we know as, as most in advance as possible if an issue is going to come up and shock detection, same uh, than the soil movement to make sure that we detect things and we detect and we identify what is happening all along the pipe so that we can make sure there is no issue. The test center that I talked before that I wanted to show because it might be of interest to, uh, to some of you, we really have a facility dedicated to, uh, to test uh, for uh, optical fiber sensing and also dedicated for uh, oil and gas. As you can see, we have a trench right now. It has been filled with the pipe that you see in which there is a whole bunch of different types of cable at a different position, uh, different uh, configurations. Next to the pipe that itself uh, can be filled and pressurized with either water or air 
different types of nozzle, different types of orientation. So we have everything we need to really do a full uh, test in uh, your conditions. Everything can be moderated to that uh, we can really uh, perform on custom tests and demonstration. So as uh, we don't have a lot of time, just a quick uh, case study uh, with uh, uh, something that uh, Total uh, came to us with uh, that wanted a solution. They needed a fast and cost-effective uh, pipeline monitoring solution. So first we did uh, the, uh, the, the test center pipeline monitoring. As you can see, we worked with them as to qualify what would be the best solution. And as we are an output, they were very satisfied with the solution. And uh, now we have a 30 kilometer of uh, gas pipeline that is being monitored in the uh, United Arab Emirates um, as we are talking. So it uh, was a very good uh, case study to work with them. Just a quick overview of our uh, clients so that you can see we work with a bit of everybody. We also work a lot with academics because they, are, they really like our very low noise floor and uh, range. So uh, the more it goes, the more we work with academics as well with uh, and private partners. And a small map just showing you a bit so that we're not afraid to go abroad, of course, uh, everywhere we've worked. And uh, don't hesitate to contact us if you, you want to help us colorize a bit this map, put a bit of yellow everywhere. We'll be glad to help you doing that with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. Super nice presentation. Okay, so then uh, regarding the, the epic question, do you have any kind of challenge or any kind of uh, requirement for your in the supply chain, something to improve that you could just uh, say here? Uh, so yeah, what um, uh, you could do for us, we could say, is uh, helping us uh, having your feedbacks on your needs and uh, what you want to do, because we are really keen on uh, continuing developing a lot of things. Right now, we are working a lot of uh, second version, third version of our system as to keep improving the performance. But depending on the needs of the client, of uh, the users, uh, we want to orient it to make sure that we go in the right direction, of course, and we develop something as uh, useful as possible. So please come, uh, come to us with some, uh, some feedback, some uh, solution that you, you might want to see uh, on the field. Uh, so on, uh, we'll, uh, we'll work with you to make it happen. Okay, very good. So any company in the room that think that can happen, uh, Febus, in, in the challenges, please uh, contact us afterwards. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have a question uh, from CSCM. CSCM is rocking today. Uh, this time is from uh, Sangon. Uh, would, would you like to make the question by yourself? Oh, hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, hello. Victor. Hello. So I, I have a question about the, uh, the subsea pipeline leak monitoring. So uh, in your presentation, uh, you mostly about the uh, buried pipeline. But do you have any experience about the uh, subsea pipeline? With subsea, subsea pipeline, we have done some, um, some, uh, some work on it. Yes, it's... Uh, uh, unfortunately, I won't be the best uh, person to talk to you to give uh -huh. you details on it. But if you want, I can uh, put you, of course, in contact with our uh, technical director, uh, Vincent Plantic, uh, that can give you some, uh, some indication on that. Uh, we have done some work. It's true that uh, using DAS can be a solution. Uh, we have seen it as to, uh, to be able to detect some, uh, some leaks in uh, subsea uh, pipelines and also using uh, DAS and DSS, so looking at the strain monitoring, as to be able to prevent this, to try and find a location where you can uh, have a fatigue, where you can have a high stress, uh, high strain uh, uh, position, so that you can know a bit in advance. Uh, you can monitor it to, uh, to try and uh, do some correction before the leak uh, arrives. So there is really the two, the uh, maintenance, the detection, and really the preventive uh, part of with uh, DAS, DSS. Can I ask one more question? Just very quick. So, so my question is, I mean, the, your presentation shows you can detect up to like a 50 bar pipeline. What limits the, the pressure? Uh, typically, it's the certification because, of course, we can. Uh, we're in the uh, in a, a dense area in Po in the south of France, and we cannot pressurize in uh, unlimitedly <laughs> our pipeline uh, of ours. Uh, uh, they won't be happy if anything happens. So okay. no, it's uh, right now it's, it's the mainly the certification. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sangon, for this question. And while talking about CSEM, let's let's stay nearby CSEM in Switzerland because we have here a company, Alpes Laser, uh, and we have here Sergis. They, they are working in the European project uh, Hydroptics. 
Uh, and uh, Sergis, I will say you, you have a slide to explain a little bit more about this project. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, hydroptics, very good. Now, now we, but we cannot hear you. You hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, great. Okay. So hi, everyone. I, I will try to be quick. So um, I'm, uh, I'm Sargis. I'm from company Alps Lasers in Switzerland. But today I'm presenting our project Hydroptics, where we coordinate it. It's a project that aims at developing advanced uh, photonic sensors for uh, improving the processes in oil and gas industry. And uh, so we do that by using um, uh, by using near IR and then mid IR uh, laser sources, of course. Uh, you can visit our website to to know more details uh, about the project. It's a Horizon 2020 project that started December 2019. Um, we will be using uh, various technologic, uh, various spectroscopic techniques to uh, to better perform the processes in the oil industry, such as hyperspectral imaging for particle classifications in uh, process water. The hydroptics will also perform um, uh, water in oil in water measurements, uh, as well as aromatic hydrocarbon in water measurements. Um, and also we'll perform a digital twin and we will do simulations with this in order to, to, to improve the processes. So since I have not much time, I'll just show you a few highlights that we selected to show today. So one of the technologies that will be used is uh, quantum cascade lasers because they laser at mid IR and uh, all the hydrocarbons have the absorption lines in the mid IR range, of course. Uh, so one of the technologies we decided to use is to use a dual comb spectroscopy. So for this, we will use uh, uh, frequency comb quantum cascade lasers, two of them being combined. And uh, by doing this, we can have a direct link between optical frequencies and radio frequencies. And we can do a spectroscopy online uh, with a very high spectral range. And one of the goals in the project is to um, integrate the setup that exists already, which is on the left side, as you can see, it's an optical table kind of, and we want to integrate this to a cheap uh, in dual comb source uh, with a germanium waveguide. Uh, in the meantime, we have also developed uh, two single color distributed feedback uh, quantum cascade laser source beam combined, as you can see here, that is already uh, develop, uh, delivered to, to, to our partners that are testing for oil and water measurements uh, online. So the hydroptics platform will be tested in uh, fields of our partners, uh, OMV in Austria and Tupras in Turkey. And again, I hope uh, I had enough time to explain the, the core concept of the project. Please visit our website and also um, yes, our you LinkedIn did. page. You did, and you are doing something great, which is to bring QCLs, quantum cascade lasers, to the oil and gas market. And we're extremely excited with everything that is happening in the mid-infrared. You are going to, later in the in the networking, you have to talk to, to Peter from Englir, and you will be amazed what they are doing also in the detector side. But before that, I think it's time it's time to rock the business side of the meeting now. I want to go to Sibel and I want to go to BP and I want to make a connection of what is happening with DAS. But before, I want to go back to Vincent. Vincent, we met last year at Adipec, you know, in Saudi Arabia. We, we know, it was two years ago. The, the, the COVID year has like gone very quick to my mind. And um, we're amazed on the huge interest from all the oil and gas giants, all the oil giants on the DAS. They all told us they had the same challenge, which is data. Data was the challenge. How do you address this and how we can make a link? I'm going to go later to Ray. I'm also going to go to Isabel to see if we can make something happening today. Uh, you're correct, but the, yeah, the, the data in uh, DAS is uh, main point. Uh, one of the main points has to take into account because it can be a challenge. Uh, so that you know, uh, we are, um, uh, if I cannot communicate on it, we're working on uh, various solutions that could, uh, that uh, could and uh, will uh, answer some uh, some issues and uh, will uh, will need to present them in a, in another uh, topic in another meeting. I would guess. Yeah, right now it's not ready to be talked about. 
you can you can tell us some spoilers. Nobody knows. Eh? It's just a private meeting. But before that, I want to go now to Ray Ray Fleming. You told us in the beginning. I'm interested about DAS. I want to know more about DAS. DAS is my passion. That is my life. Ray, uh, when we talk about DAS to the huge uh, oil companies, we always come up with the data challenge. Could you tell us a bit about this and maybe what is your main concern when you hear the presentation from Phoebus Optics? They can do everything you want. So what is missing? Yeah, well, I think I think the the there there are there are there are two challenges with 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 with, with that. The first is the is the sheer volume of data which is which is uh, is available and needs to be uh, processed. Then the second piece is all around uh, digital security. So how can we transfer vast amounts of data um, securely? And sometimes we do it by actually transferring drives. Or, or, but really, it's our our challenge is how do we do that? How how can we how, how can we uh, connect uh, and transfer and transmit data securely, or uh, um, using um, uh, you know using cloud services? So so that's that. So really, for us, it's it's the it's, it's it's the volume of data, and we're really helped by some of our partners at, at the minute. Um, and but it's 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 tempered by how we can do that securely, you know. So so digital security is a huge uh, is a huge part of our of uh, is, is a huge issue for us. And particularly the information, you know, the type of information that's being shared here is actually very sensitive. And so so you, you so you so arguably you've got sort of three challenges. Really, it's uh, 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 the volume of data being processed, and then the security. And then obviously linked to the security is the sensitivity of the data. So it's really, it's, uh, um, it's, it's things that we are kind of working on. We would like to get some more inf information. We, we are working in it very well with, our, with some of our partners. Um, but um, so far, we, we, seem to be, uh, we seem to be managing it. But the data, data management and data processing is still going to be a, a, a huge challenge. And then the other thing too, just while I'm on it, is really the visualization of that data. So, yes. so, so, how can we present that data to uh, to uh, to end users who may not be uh, who may not be um, um, uh, familiar with some of the visualization techniques that are currently being used? So, so, there's, so anyway, but I mean, ultimately, the um, the work that we're currently involved in, which is actually getting fiber. Subsea getting fiber down hole is only part of the you know, the, the real the, you know, the 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 real goal is the data how we analyze the data and uh, and, and and how that data is ultimately used. I want uh, Steve to comment on this, but before, please respect my naive my naive brain. Why is secure transmission of this data a big challenge? Why are you? What are you worried? What kind of information can they get from this DAS data, which is and understandable for any anybody. Well, the DES data. I mean, a lot of the data that 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 we will be providing is is data which is sensitive to either downhole um, application or to reservoir. I mean, at, at the moment, it's more to do with the uh, it's more to do with the 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 uh, the wellbore rather than the reservoir. But the reservoir data is very important to oil companies. That's really that is re really very extremely. Sensitive data. Steve data. from Lit, how are you gonna help Phoebus and Ray make a connection today? I want to make something happen. Well, in uh, in some extent, we are actually already helping Ray. Light actually came out from uh, the technology group in BP, and we now are a resident of uh, of what uh, BP calls Launchpad. Uh, so what Ray says and what uh, what Victor has, has commented on as well is obviously the data is is huge amount of data, roughly about a terabyte an hour uh, is what a DAS system is, is uh, putting out there. And what Light does is based upon our, our power recognition and our flow testing and, and physics-based algorithms, we're able to, to basically uh, bring that data requirement down to about uh, several hundred megabytes versus a terabyte per hour. So we actually make it where it's uh, it's feasible to stream that data to the cloud to process. 700 megabytes about five actually it ends up being about 400 megabytes so uh, from hour. a terabyte from a terabyte an hour to about 400 megabytes per hour 
Fair so down. considerably more uh, more reasonable, uh, and that's just basically extracting uh, several sets of, of features that we've identified as being key to uh, identifying uh, different parameters within the well, whether that be uh, multi-phase inflow, uh, sand egress, uh, or integrity issues. All right. So, uh, Steve, I think, well, my job is done, but I want you, all of you, I want Vincent, Steve, and the uh, right to meet one person I'm going to bring to a table. I'm going to go to one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I'm going to go to Valencia, and I'm going to go to Cal Sense and the University of Politecnica de Valencia. My friend, Salvador, Salva, uh, all these people are deploying new sensor technology. They are worried about the data. I would like somebody who develops sensors with the whole system in mind. Salvador, what do you bring to the table and what kind of things we can do between Phoebus, BP, and LEED today and CalSense? Well, uh, it's a tough question. Do you listen to me, no? Loud and clear. I get no commission. I just want you to do business. No, no, no. Thanks. Uh, well, you know, we are... We are new in this in this market. We are coming from the serial the structure engineering monitoring. I understand the, the the problem of the of the data because we have the same. We have we are now monitoring a lot of sensors and and the only thing is to to make some process before sending the data because if not it's impossible. So maybe we can we can help you with with this because we made some computing not to send all the data at the same time. And I don't know. On the other side, uh, it was very for for us. It was very interesting the the talk from Phoebus, Phoebus Optics, and and maybe we can we can talk with them for in a future for for kind of collaboration because you will have some technologies that we can uh, we are looking for, and maybe you don't have a partner in in Spain and in South America, so maybe we can we can chat later and we can make some. Vincent, have a look at all the projects cancels have been involved there in their website. You will be amazed. But I want to go now to another end user. I want to go to Sibel because I want to ask Isabel. Isabel, first, I know you have a question for Phoebus. Ask away. And then afterwards, tell me what you bring to the table and what kind of needs we can do to cover with this supply chain and building today. Thank you, Jose. Um, so my name is Isabel Pellegrini from Sibel. Um, yes, I have a question for uh, Vincent. What is the noise floor of your dust interrogator? So the uh, noise floor of the um, A1R uh, dust uh, that we produce is at uh, eight picostrains using uh, standard uh, telecommunication fibers. Uh, of course, it can go even lower if we use engineered fibers. Can you state that in terms of uh, SNR? Uh, I can put you in contact with someone that's going to be very capable of doing this. Uh, on like, it goes a little bit over my head for this very technical. No problem. Very about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes and I would say to answer your question, it's a bit of a spoiler to my presentation. Then don't, then don't spoil me. Don't give me spoilers, <laughs> you know, not Netflix spoiler, no online technology meeting spoiler. Meet my friends. You have to meet one of my best friends in, in, the, in Slovakia is Peter Lowe from Silex, which is the company developed the fire for this Genoa Bridge beautiful story I told you about. Peter, uh, you have here Sibel, you have BP. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. Sure. Um, I'm happy to join this meeting today because I'm also curious about uh, the applications of specifically of the ABG technology in the oil and gas industry. And uh, Silex is mainly focused on developing and, of course, producing um, Arch environment and custom built FBG based sensors, very similarly like Sony do and some other companies here as well. And uh, just recently, a year ago, we participated to a project where we have also developed a specific displacement sensor, you can call it also a strain sensor that has been a subsea integrated down to 40, 50 meters uh, subsea. So it's four to five bar, it's not really uh, ultra deep sea, but it's an application to be directly mounted on, a, on an existing pipeline to monitor its uh, uh, functionality and possibly prevent to some failures and, um, and ecological uh, catastrophes. So that's uh, already a nice batch of um, experiences doing something in a subsea environment. And um, we have been basically proving that the capabilities of developing such, um, such a system is possible with FDG. Uh, the integration went well, although not done uh, by our company. That's, of course, more a focus for companies who know how to 
install it down holes with, uh, with divers. And uh, so that's uh, something we can uh, probably offer to Thank uh, you very much, Peter. You know, like after that. the meeting, exactly at five o'clock, you're going to get a link in the chat. All of you, we are going to leave the Zoom. We're going to go to this, where we all can talk to each other and you can meet, you can meet Ray, you can meet Isabel and have the follow-up <laughs> discussion, which makes those meetings successful. But before that, we have something very special. All of you have showed extreme interest in DAS. So we brought one of the biggest success stories worldwide in DAS. We brought Silixa looking for partnerships at this meeting. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We know we ask you, we ask you, we really wanted you to be in this meeting. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Silixa. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Epic. Um, I'm gonna show my presentations. Um, hopefully you can see it. Um, now we can see your mailbox, so not looking. You go to slideshow mode and you are sharing the wrong screen. Ah, oh, you know the drill. If you go to slideshow mode, then we can be better. Yes, the floor is yours. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, we are trying to keep this presentation short, uh, but I have a few slides just in the anticipation for some questions. So my tongue is a bit slow today. Um, so just as an introduction, um, Selexa actually um, it's um, a global leading provider for fiber optics, you know, powered by data solutions. I will explain what it means. Um, although we make different interrogators, but you know, our focus is really towards the application. Um, so we are working in what we call alternative energy, mining, uh, environmental, air science, monitoring infrastructures, and also oil and gas. Um, we got uh, a suite of uh, different distributed sensing, not just the air, so we describe those. And we have a dedicated team here, not only in photonics, but you know, in signal processing, in um, uh, geophysics. Uh, so we try to create a multidisciplinary company. Um, because technology is very exciting, but I think what's it's most exciting is how the technology can be applied to, you know, to real uh, solution in life. Um, so activities, um, we are very global footprints. Um, our head office is in the UK, um, but we have a very good presence in US, in Houston and Montana. And we operate in you know, the Middle East, Canada, and everywhere else. Um, our investors are companies like Chevron, the strate strategic investors, Nymer Partners, and Econor. Um, so um, just to bring us back to some of the technical discussions, um, I mean, the distributed sensing obviously makes use of what we call the a scattering mechanism in the fiber. So you launch a laser pulse into the fiber. And as the laser pulse travels down the fiber, it would actually interact with glass or silica. And you get what it's well known as a Rayleigh scatter light, which is mainly used in telecom to test fibers for losses. But we use it for sensing in the case of DAS. Um, but also the other scattering mechanism like brillium scattering, which are inelastic scattering. That means that the scatter signal is actually frequency shifted with respect to the light you put into the fiber. And you also have the Raman uh, stokes and anti-stokes scattering. So here you actually now look at the interaction of the light with the glass. So using this information, you can actually measure the state of the fiber. So hence, we can use the fiber as a sensor. And in this case, um, we will look at some um, linear static measurements. But in this case of uh, Lilium and Raman, we actually look at the, the transfer of energy from optics to vibrations and vice versa. So understanding some of the basics is very important to see what we can measure. Um, and these measurements, it's utilized. Usually you build in an interrogator, which is part of the measurements. Then you have the optical fiber, um, which in this case we use as a distributor sensors. 
the laser pulse goes into the fiber. And as it goes, you get a small scatter light going back. And then by analyzing this scatter light, you can measure you know, acoustic temperature strain. But in case of DAS, you know, the acoustic vibration energy, which um, produces or induces a strain, and this is very important um, transfer functions, how the pressure or acoustics is translated to strain onto the fiber is a big topic. And then that um, gets translated to um, distributed measurement of vibration or acoustics along the fiber. You know, there are obviously two types of DAS systems. One is intensity based, which was the earlier one, but we mainly focus on coherent DAS. That means that the same laser pulse that is actually injected into the fiber used as a synchronization clock. So we have actually effectively a fa an acoustic phase array. Uh, and you can actually now think of the fiber as an acoustic antenna with all these sensing elements, which is just a continuous length of the fiber as um, uh, a phase array. And so you can not only do acoustic measurements, but you can actually do acoustic imaging as well. But we are also um, in sensing business because obviously the fiber optic has been um, used for telecom. And the main interest is to send a signal from A to B, but in case of sensing applications, we want to send a signal into the fiber, but we also look at what's coming back, especially if it's um, OTDR type of systems. So in sensing applications, we want to enhance the properties of the fiber more towards the sensing. So we actually, um, and pioneered uh, what we call the engineered fiber, which actually um, improves the collection of the scattering light. Because as you can imagine, the Rayleigh scattering is very inefficient. You get scattering in all directions. So most of the scatter light is actually not captured by the fiber. But in case of telecom, that's not critical. But in case of sensing, this is our signal. So we can actually increase the signal level by 100 times and or even more. Um, and that means that we get more photons back from the fiber. And obviously the photons, good photons we call them, um, you know, you could then improve the shot noise limit of our system by a factor of 100 uh, or square root of N. That means that in terms of acoustic sensitivity, we are 100 times more sensitive. Um, and this has got a lot of benefits, especially you know, for sensing applications. Um, so before we get to the benefits, um, so we can actually uh, show you, you know, we have uh, temperature sensors, acoustics. Carina is our new system, which is based on the new engineered fibers or constellation fiber. We also have a very high resolution um, distributed um, strain sensors. This is also based on the technology we use in Carina because we actually measure optical phase. In case of brilliant, the scatter signal, um, it's uh, frequency shifted. So we can also use this very highly precision optical phase to measure the frequency of the scatter light and hence we can measure static strain. And we also have introduced a new type of measurements. We call it optical fiber ruler. So this is essentially, you know, if you have a fiber and you know you can be uh, tens of kilometers by introducing scatter centers, we can actually use the fiber as a, an optical ruler, optical fiber ruler, and we can actually measure any deformations or changes in distances. So it can really use as an integrated strain sensor. So the engineer fiber, the advantage, for example, higher signal to noise ratio in here, you can see standard single mode fiber. This is with the engineered fiber. So we can actually get geophone equivalent um, um, signal to noise or even better in some cases. Uh, we can then use lower source energies. So this can be also used for permanent or on-demand seismic measurements. We are more tolerant to uh, losses, and we can actually go to longer range. For example, in case of subsea, we have a long tiebacks, then you have losses in connectors. 
you know, this is a standard fiber after 5 dB, you don't see much. By using the engineered fiber, uh, we can get uh, recover that loss and we can actually get better measurements even compared to the standard fiber at the remote locations. Um, we can also do, um, uh, usually when you do seismic, you have to stack the data, but this is, you know, like about um, 38 shots, but this is just single shots. So that means that you can actually do seismic in a dynamic situation, for example, like hydrofracking. So we can actually see how the reservoir is changing as they do in injection of the fluid into the reservoir or pumping oil uh, or pumping waters um, or trying to frack the rock. Um, <clears throat> so this is one example of what we applied the uh, Karina in subsea. So actually this was in collaborations with Light and with BP. So we can see that we actually have done uh, successful completions of the uh, fiber optic systems. And I think we'll be hearing a lot more uh, in these um, other workshops. And the whole idea with putting the fiber actually uh, downhole in subsurface, you can get much better images of subsalt um, and but this is really now in place and in practice. So it's operational, uh, big achievement. We're also looking, for example, at uh, carbon storage, where, you know, safe carbon storage means that we need to be able to monitor uh, the migration of the gas within the geological uh, structure. So again, this type of um, in, improve and enhance um, measurements plus permanent seismic sources, plus DTS, plus you know, static strain, and fiber nula can give us a very good picture of what's happening in subsurface. We can you know, subsidence monitoring um, in a minute scale. Um, so um, the benefit of uh, fiber optics in all wells, you know, for example, with one fiber, this is what we use as a vision, um, which we can actually uh, have one fiber to do borehole seismic. You can actually look at the completions, like you know, how the cement is bonding. You can look at fracture analysis. You can look at low, uh, profiling, flow profiling. We do a lot of work in this area where we can use fiber optics as an array of um, the strain gauges and we can measure the flow rates along the pipe. You can look at the leak detections and we can actually, because the fiber is permanently installed, we can go and do repeat seismic with a very good um, depth and time correlation. And when actually you uh, want to abandon the well, you can look at you know a safe abandonment of the wells. Um, now, uh, epic questions, I guess, is, um, there's obviously a lot has been achieved, you know, fiber optics provides tremendous new applications in oil and gas. Uh, we can see that we can even go to long reach, long offset subsea wells, um, which before was impossible, especially with the further development of fiber optics. So uh, what we see is the laser technology is very important, you know, um, and I can give you a wish list in terms of, you know, what I want to have as a, you know, somebody who wants to build a system uh, rather than components. Um, I'd like to be able to control the spectral, preservations, modulation. Um, obviously, you know, the fiber, which is our sensor, is very critical. So enhancing its properties for sensing applications. And I can see many other scope for improvement of the fiber properties. So engineer the fiber or make it more functional or multifunctional fibers or bundle of fibers. Um, and the other thing is, um, it's important. It's not just about the integrator and fiber, it's how we can actually engineer the cable and look at the installation methods. So we have some ideas in terms of how practically these things could be applied. You know, we talked about connector losses, but importantly, if you want to measure flow, you have to understand the transfer functions of the flow motions into the pipe, into the cable, into the fiber. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is um, obviously low loss, high power optical fibers, where there's a lot of interest in remote applications we heard that people want to go to 
um, maybe 100 kilometers or even more. So I think you know there is a scope in here. We see a lot of work has been done in telecom for getting for subsea applications. And you can even put more power through the fibers and to go to longer distances. Um, we see that the improvement in uh, the doctrine optical receiver chain, for example, also you know remote amplifications. Um, it's uh, also we can uh, apply what we learn from telecoms, but obviously with sensing, these things need to be improved or modified. And we're actually implementing some of these solutions today. Um, and the important things, as I said, in understanding and how we can actually get better acoustic conversions um, from optical to acoustic conversions. There's a lot of interest in uh, low frequency applications, but actually the fiber can go to you know, millihertz or even you know, strain measurements. We get the very, very low frequencies and some of the application we're talking to some scientists right now, it's potential of using the fiber as a gravitational wave detector. Um, <clears throat> there's obviously a scope for improving optical signal processing, especially with the integrated photonics. I think there's a lot of a scope for that. And, you know, fast data processing, you know, making the measurements real time and data transmission with the fiber can play a big role. And as we heard, you know, we're talking about terabytes of data, I would say per day, per roll. But if you have multiple roles, this can really build up. So it's very important to be able to analyze and store critical information from the data um, at every point. Um, and then I think once you have a meaningful uh, measurement, uh, we can then start to look at pattern recognitions, machine learning. Um, there was a very good paper by some people applied you know, deep learning to some seismic uh, data to try to do real-time um, migrations. But actually what it revealed was just that uh, nothing to do with the migrated images, but it actually revealed that there's very efficient in detecting faults um, and patterns like that, which is also what is being used for X-ray analysis. But you know, there's a scope, uh, a lot of um, scope in here to do real time reservoir imaging. And I guess, you know, there's a big role, you know, with all this volume of data and processing, you know, connecting the space and time together, you know, quantum computing, I think that would be a, a great inroads. Um, I finished with this slide and then um, Okay. Thank you very much. This was an incredible slide. And also, um, well, you will need more than one online technology meeting to cover all these challenges. For example, the quantum computing one. I don't think we have a quantum computing company in the room, but we can have it uh, in the next one. Uh, so, well, thank you very much for all these, um, for all these uh, challenges. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, do, you do you also fabricate the, the fibers by yourself? or you are buying the fibers? I think what we have is, um, yeah, the fiber is very important for us. Uh, we don't manufacture fibers. You know, we are mainly like um, designing interrogators and system solution provider, but we collaborate with uh, a lot of very good companies, which are also Epic members in here on optical fibers we could the specify requirements for sensing applications. And we work very closely with them to bring you know, the solutions to real world applications. Uh, okay, we, because we have one of these uh, companies in the room. So maybe they are already, you already know them very well, but well, just in case. Uh, Paul Eric uh, from OFS. Would you like to, hello, Paul. Uh, hello. Would you like to explain what is OF is doing in manufacturing fibers? I mean, as key player. And maybe do you have one slide to show us? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you very much for this uh, meeting here. I will share one slide that I have here. I think I have a slide move. But OFS, for those of you that are not familiar um, with, the, with OFS, uh, we are a major maker of uh, telecom fibers, fibers, uh, glass fiber. All, all we do is with glass, 
And glass is what we hear uh, from any, a lot of excellent presentation here. The glass is needed. So you have the different uh, refractions uh, going on. Or as we are a big, uh, commercial, uh, big uh, company, uh, American, owned by Furukawa Electric in, uh, in Japan. So we are on the Jap on Tokyo Stock Exchange on the Furukawa. Our main business is telecommunication, and I'm extremely excited also to hear that uh, a lot of our fibers, they actually today are used in, in many of the application. I do know they're used in a lot of the application that uh, we have talked about here, also including very low loss and low uh, and high effective area fibers. So what I'm, what my purpose here is today, when I look in what we can do for you and what you can do for us, is we have the family called Linear Sense. It is part of OFS specialty fiber. And in this product portfolio, we are trying to focus in just special fiber. But keep in mind, we have all other commercial available fiber that you are currently using. We have fiber specialized for uh, DAS. We have a, what we call an acoustic sense fiber. It is an engineered fiber where you can have up to 20 dB uh, better signal to noise ratio as compared to a standard signal fiber. And this is a family of fiber where we can actually also uh, tune the performance depending on what you are looking into. In the, the domain of uh, DTS and it's say Raman, but it could actually be employed to any, any other fiber. In, in distributed temperature sensing, many times you are interested to go into very hot areas, also in oil and gas, uh, maybe not in, in the offshore, but like in SAC-D, where you need to go to very high temperature and other, uh, other areas. So our fibers are able to run at 300 degrees centigrade for 25 years, and it for limited uh, time frame, it can run up to 400 degrees. So we have this special we call pyrocode K. So this is basically a coating that we apply to the glass fiber. So we can apply it to any kind of glass fiber. And when it comes to the glass fiber itself, we have the standard graded index mode fiber and we have single mode, which are manual free. And lastly, we do also have a carbon coating. Carbon is very efficient to prevent hydrogen darkening. Uh, that is a a problem in, in oil and gas downgoal because you have a lot of free hydrogen in, in this uh, environment. Uh, for the DTS and DSS uh, distributed uh, strain sensing, we have single mode, we have carbon coated polyimide and germanium free. And I could continue like that for, for a very, very long time, but I don't have so much time. So my purpose is here, let's dialogue. And uh, what we can do for you is we would like to collaborate with you in the very early stage of the design. Uh, we can also, if you already have something that you have developed and you would like to explore even further, please contact us. Of course, we, and we will. But I'm very curious about this, this 300 degree temperature. Let's, let's have a, a quick ultra fast debate about this. Mahmoud, one of your challenges was uh, optical fiber for high temperatures. What kind of temperature do you have in mind? Well, I mean, I think the oil and gas applications, you know, starts from anything that's above 60 degrees, but it can go up to, um, you know, for subsea applications, we are looking at 150 degrees, 175 degrees C, but in some way, in um, actually um, sag D wells, uh, where they inject the steam, you're talking about 300 degrees C, which again, mm -hmm. are my fibers. But for some other very specific applications where they actually put heaters in the ground to you know, break down the oil, you're talking about 500 degrees C, and that's where you move into metal coated fibers. Uh, so, and the price would go. Mahmoud, I have very good news for you. In the, in the room, we have uh, people from RICE in Sweden. Actually, we have Asa. I, will, I would like to, for you to meet her later because she actually presented in one of our meetings up to 750 degrees C. 750 degrees to be, used, to be used in industrial environments. And Paul, it is really great to have you here. Back to Anna. Anna, what's next? Surprise us, something cool. I want to hear something cool. Only 15 minutes left of meeting. OK, yes. Yeah, so maybe this is a good moment to introduce one of the companies, organizations we have in the in the room. So in this case, it's Inestec. So maybe, Guillermo, uh, would you like to explain us a little bit what is how can uh, Inestec to help these companies to develop new systems in fiber sensing? 
Okay, thank you, thank you, Anna and Jose, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to, to be here. Let me share my screen with you. Can you see it? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, very well. Well, yeah? you can go to. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Now you go. Sorry, sorry about that. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Guilherme, and I'm an IP manager at Inestec. And it's like the research, a Portuguese research institute. And today I'm going to introduce to you one of our technologies in the photonic area. That's the linear cavity ring doll sensing. Well, well CRD sensing, the linear CRD sensing is an innovative optical fiber configuration that makes possible long distance sensing using commercial equipment such as the LTDR that I show here. Thus enabling a more efficient, compact and easy handling uh, sensing system. Also, our inventors have converted the conventional uh, ring in the CRD configuration to a linear one, and hence it doubles the sensitivity, sensitivity of the sensing device. The CRD system combined with the OTDR enables the accurate long distance sensing up to 20 kilometers and the quantification of compounds of interest both in liquid or gas medium particularly in harsh environments, like the ones we can find in oil and gas uh, production. Uh, in short, what we are offering is a, a unique technology with a granted patent in the US that allows the use of OTDR for sensor interrogation combined with an increased CRD sensitivity. And we are looking for a partner to integrate the CRD sensing technology to the OTDR. So if you're interested, please contact contact me so we can further discuss it. And Jose, I don't know if it's allowed, but if someone requests, feel free to share my slides with them. Of course it's allowed. Anything that you do as an Epic member, everything is allowed. You know, the, 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 right. the, we, there are no rules here. You ask us and if it's legal, we'll do it. And if it's not legal, we'll never ask, we'll never tell anyone. So it is clear they are looking for an integrator and R&D yes. partners. One of them, the key ones here is actually Adva. Sander, what's on your mind? Yeah, I was just, uh, I need some help here. What is CRD? What do you mean there? It's, it's cavity ring down. Cavity ring now, it's based on the spectrometry, cavity ring down, like you have the, the loop in the, the optical fiber. Yeah. So the, the, when you when the, you have like the, the transmission light, it goes up to the, let's say the target, and it goes back and forth several times and the, the intensity of the signal decays over time. And now using the OTDR instead of the traditional uh, CRD spectro, spectro, sorry, the spectrometry, then you can have a, a, like a simpler system because the OTDR, it can do the transmission and, the, and read the reflected light in the same, using the same fiber. Okay. So yeah. It's a more compact, uh, more compact system. So I, I definitely be up for discussion here and I can show you our uh, OTDR system and uh, yeah, let's see if we can combine these things. Fantastic, Sander, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guillermo, if something happened with Sander here, it's an epic thing that happened. I advise the key system integrator. We have now the two end users to present, Sibel and Halliburton. We're going to finish like a few minutes late. I'm so sorry for this. Please apologize, but it's totally worth it. We now go to Sibel. And we want to ask them the epic question and also start new collaboration. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. Use it wisely. Isabel, yes, I'm action? trying to share my screen here. <laughs> Button of the room, I got row up, which is green. You click on it, select the window yes. to share, and the world That's is your yours. Screen. Can you confirm you're seeing it? Crystal clear. OK, let me just move my stuff here. All right. So um, my name is Isabel Pellegrini. I'm with Isabel. Uh, thank you, Epic, uh, for inviting me to talk here. Uh, so unlike uh, some other players in the room, we are exclusively intervention-based company. That means we run uh, fiber in the wells temporarily, and then we retrieve it or not. And we have several ways of doing that. Uh, one of those is our Z system, uh, which you can see here on the left picture. Um, 
So here you can see a reel with a carbon rod. We also have an electrified rod and we push that in the well and uh, leave it there during the time of the acquisition and then uh, go back to surface. Recently, we have started a partnership with uh, WellSense, uh, who has developed uh, the flight fiber line sensing. It's essentially a tool that uh, contains uh, a standard fiber, uh, naked fiber that you drop in the well and the fiber uncoils as you go down in the well. Uh, and we've now used that several times. And the advantage of that is that you can actually see how the tool is uncoiling as you go down. This is a picture from our real-time uh, monitoring uh, viewer. Uh, and then soon we are go also going to have a fiber optic wireline monoconductor. Currently, we are mostly operating in uh, unconventional wells. Um, so this picture here illustrates a number of uh, horizontal and conventional wells that are being fracked, as you know. And the idea is to understand how well the frack uh, has gone, uh, how much the well is producing, what is the cluster efficiency, for example, from this frack, but also while you are monitoring, say, a parent well, uh, you want to see if you have fracture-driven interactions or so-called frack hits uh, between your wells, i.e. so if you are sitting in a well that you're monitoring, uh, is one of the fractures of the well being fracked uh, propag propagating to the monitoring well. Uh, so this has become quite uh, fashionable in uh, unconventionals at the moment, and we are doing a lot of work uh, with that. So to continue on, then uh, derive the applications or, uh, from these, those unconventional wells. So here you can see, for example, a series of, uh, of frack hits. Uh, that have been recorded in a monitoring well while a child well was being fracked. Uh, here you can see here, this is a zoom of, uh, of a frack heat uh, with the red stuff here being uh, uh, expansion and, and uh, the blue color, uh, the compression or the stress shadow, uh, if you want to call it. Uh, and here you can see as the fracture is closing, you can see that the colors are reversing because the, the, the stresses are reversing. Uh, we also have a, uh, an answer product, flow illuminator, that uh, is about flow profiling, uh, fracture efficiency, cluster efficiency, etc. Uh, and we also do well interference. So say if you are in, a, in one well monitoring it, uh, and you are changing uh, the flow parameters uh, of a, a nearby well, uh, then you can see what effect it has on the well you are monitoring. So for example, in this well, you can see that before uh, you actually close the nearby well, the monitor well is not flowing much. But uh, once you've closed it, all of a sudden you get a lot more production. Now, when it comes to the challenges, uh, so some of my uh, peers here have already discussed that. Uh, but I think one of the main challenges that we have in the industry is uh, the signal to noise ratio and the spatial resolution of standard systems. Um, so more and more, we are going into very long horizontal wells. Uh, and once you exceed five kilometers or 15,000 feet of, of measured depth, uh, it becomes difficult to actually see or get any uh, acoustic response from very quiet flow. Uh, and some of, uh, of my peers have discussed the fact that uh, you, you actually need uh, as low as 95 
dB of noise floor to actually measure the lowest uh, flow rate. Um, it's not just the, the quiet flow. So, so it's not just about subsea and distance and, and, and losing the signal along the fiber. It's also the fact that what you're trying to measure uh, as a weak signal in the first place. So that's for uh, very low flow rates, uh, laminar flow rates. It's for low rate leaks, for example, uh, but it could also be for weak crack hits, for example. Another challenge is about high temperature fibers. So if you take the, the, the Wellsense uh, fiber line two, for example, which is a naked fiber, uh, it could be that it could be very useful to actually have a fiber uh, that is able to uh, to withstand higher temperatures. Uh, and then, so when you are in a job for say three weeks to one month in the same well, uh, then you don't have to use uh, several tools uh, to 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 finish the job. In terms of uh, integration with reservoir monitoring, because the end goal is after all to provide meaningful solutions to, to the oil and gas industry. And so, yes, there is a lot of data uh, and, and you do need to, um, to, to, to transform that data as soon as possible. So I firmly believe that the next generation interrogator has to take some of that load. Uh, you really need to think about an interrogator nowadays is not just a piece of hardware, but uh, actually a, a super processing computer uh, that will be able to take care of the pre-processing uh, and the part of the chain that is not uh, that much value adding, like you know the, the FFT, the destination and all that kind of stuff. I think every, uh, nowadays everybody knows how to do that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be the service company who does it. I think the interrogator can take care of that so that the service companies can actually focus on the next level of value adding, uh, which is, as Mahmoud was saying, for example, machine learning. How do you integrate the data that you are measuring? Uh, how, do you, how do you integrate the DAS data? With, uh, with the physical property of the flow, with the rock properties of, of your reservoir. So I think this is the, the, the next level and, and this is what is going to bring value to, uh, to our customers in the future. Uh, there is also uh, an issue with formats. Um, so currently, DAS is, is mostly uh, output in uh, HEF5 format. Um, um, in logistics audio format, but uh, you know, uh, traditional wireline or uh, or DLM type of measurement uh, are using LAS or DLIS, etc. So I think there is some work there to do to uh, uh, to make all that stuff compatible, so it's easier to display. Uh, and obviously, when it comes to to display, you have people who are used to, to dealing with 2D data uh, as logs and, and the others who are used to dealing with the 3D aspects of the DAS, for example, uh, where you have the time uh, information. Uh, and so th those two aspects need to be, uh, to be reconciled to, to make a display that everybody understands. And that needs to be integrated into the current uh, reservoir monitoring engines, for example. Another challenge is the triaxial response. Uh, so uh, a fiber, a traditional fiber, for example, uh, is not responding to orthogonal uh, compressional waves, for example. Uh, and so if you want to know the exact location of micro seismic events, as, as shown on the illustration here, uh, you would need to have several fibers uh, in, in several locations, which is not always possible. I mean, let's face it, most of the wells are still not instrumented. Uh, so if someone were able to find a solution to actually make a single fiber capable of triaxial monitoring, I think that could bring some value. Then um, Mahmoud also mentioned the transfer functions. 
uh, of the cables, uh, understanding the transfer function, you know, for temperature, for flow, uh, for the pipe mode, etc. So I totally agree with you on that, Mahmoud. And uh, and obviously there is uh, always the the specter of the uh, offshore intervention costs. Uh, it's very difficult um, if you don't have collocated uh, equipment uh, on, on offshore platforms, for example, to, to actually do an intervention. And, and again, it's a pity because most, most of the wells are not instrumented. This is what I have. Thank you very much, Isabella. Very nice introduction. Thank you very much for this slide with all the challenges. For the companies in the room, please, if you have, um, if you think you can help Isabella with any of them, uh, please raise your, yeah, raise your hand and we can still comment. But in the meantime, I would love to give the, the floor to Remco from Somni. Uh, Remco, do you think you could help uh, Isabella with any of these challenges, maybe with how to reduce um, signal to, to noise radio with your systems? Uh, yeah, perhaps. I'm sorry. I had to step out of the, 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 the talk for a, a short short while. So I'm, I'm very sorry, Isabel, but I, I missed part of your of your talk. Um, so um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet how to how to contribute, but you know, we, we have some very nice uh, sensors, uh, sensors which are which can be complementary to the system uh, you have. And I would suggest let's have a talk uh, after this, uh, this session, if you have time. Yes, of course, we will make sure that you get an introduction and you can follow this, uh, this talk later. Uh, now, if there are no more uh, comments, I think we will, we could move to the next. Uh, to Actually, the next. Yeah, sorry, Anna, I have a really quick comment that I forgot to mention. Yes, uh, please. In terms of challenges. I think it would be useful to have a simultaneous temperature correction or dust corrected uh, uh, measurement that, that is temperature corrected essentially, instead of having to do that afterwards or, you know, this is something that could be very useful. Thank you very much for this. Uh, please, if any company uh, in the room has a solution for this, we will be very happy to um, to, to connect you with Isabella. And now let's go for uh, our last but not least uh, uh, talk of today. So Glenn uh, from Halliburton, I hope now he, everything is, uh, is working and we can see your slide, please, if you can go to presentation mode. Okay, maybe the... Um, I think right now, maybe you can try again to share your screen. I'm going Yes, and uh, thank you. And apologies for the internet connectivity. Fiber is obviously better than satellite. That's for the, this meeting demonstrates. Fibers are working today better in the sea, no, than in the... Okay, let's try. Okay, Glenn, I, we, we cannot hear you. Probably, we, we, I think we still have some problems with the, um, with the connection. So Glenn, are, are you here? I think we lost the uh, Glenn. Um, Again, maybe we can try again during the wonder meet. Uh, now, after the meeting, we will have a, we will have the opportunity to talk with the speakers that can stay. So, yes, uh, maybe yes. Uh, Glenn is not here anymore. I love when I put Anna in the spot. She's like, okay, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Isn't it lovely? It was a great meeting. So what we're going to do with Halliburton is going to reschedule for the next one. That's it. Because Epic is going to be alive for many years. We've been alive for 16 and a half years, and we have at least 50 more years to be alive with. So what I would like to say is that, first of all, it was a fantastic meeting. We actually collected, collected challenges, and we offered solutions. I love really the way that we actually connected the data management 
of that system as a challenge, and we connected it with Lit and Luna solutions to glide it down to 400 megabits per hour. I also love that the standard Cine Tuner Razor Spatial Resolution is really a challenge. Siever was very clear on that. And we had the low noise lasers of NKT. We also heard about the high temperature fibers needed, 500 degrees C. And you're going to be amazed of what RICE can do in Sweden. You have to connect with them. And we also heard about the need for new generation of interrogator units, especially for displacement. And we had the opportunity to collaborate with JPEX. So what, what is going to happen now? What's going to happen now? YouTubers are not going to see this, but you in the Zoom room are going to see it. We are all going to get a link in the chat. All you have to do is click there and close Zoom, and you will appear in an environment for you to get to know each other, which is what the meeting is all about. And I also would like to say that I really love what we are doing with this industry. It was two hours, two hours and nine minutes, sorry for that, to make sure that we find you suppliers, customers, and partners. Anna and me, we develop a lot of energies and our job is mostly done. Now it is your turn. Please make sure that you follow up. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.poto at epic-asac.com, and I will make sure I make the introduction because I just love doing that on behalf of a fantastic thing, a fantastic thing which I love and I think they love me, a medical expert, integrated photonic expert, laser solution providers, optics and quantum specialists, an innovation manager from, Ita from Italy that is totally crazy, a new photon head of photonic market, Richard Tracy Vanik, and a great thing on marketing, or communications, and the CEO that you all know, Carlos Lee, I would like to tell you that you should wash your hands, wear a mask, and stay healthy and safe because very, very, very soon we are going to travel again. And we have a meeting in Lisbon, held by HBK Fiber Sensing that you cannot miss. As soon as the whole COVID-19 is history and we can start traveling again. Until the next time, bye-bye.